So let's get to uh, draft Jesse. I want to get into um, you know what, what what I brought you on to talk about today, oh, and um, so so just describe like like nuts and bolts, like like what is it? Well, the so the the people for Jesse draft Jesse uh, political action committee is a it's a campaign intending to draft Governor Jesse Ventura uh, to run for the president of the United States. We originally started out as trying to draft him for the Green Party nomination, but after dealing with a pretty messed up process there, we elected to shift towards an independent run. And so what we're doing currently is we're gathering pledged electors in, we can get 39 states, we can get approved write-in access, plus DC, for a total of 449 electoral votes, uh, potentially, it could be won uh, by Jesse Ventura through a write-in campaign. So that's that's where we're at currently. We're gathering signatures in California. We can put them on the ballot, whether or not he signs the paperwork. Um, and we're presenting to him all of the electors, you know, that we've got. I can't show my hand strategy-wise, but uh, you know, we we've got our methods, and we're getting in touch. And um, yeah, we're gonna show him because he's told us before that. If you write him in, he'll do the job. He mentioned that on Primo Nutmeg when he said he was doing a write-in. He would be writing himself in. He rescinded his endorsement of the Green Party. And so we're hoping that he'll live up to his end of the bargain. You know, we're going to show him that he owes it to all these people. We have over 10,000 folks who signed a petition. That was more than any Green Party candidate got in terms of popular support. Um, and we're going to show the governor that all these folks around the country, he owes it to them to make their votes count. And he just has to sign some paperwork to do it. So looking at it like thematically, um, I, you know, am intrigued by stuff like this, not just because I think more stuff like this should happen, but because I actually think it should be required. I think that nobody should be allowed to nominate themselves. Um, I think that politicians should be recruited. And here's the deal. First of all, that was one of the ideas the Greeks had. One of the ideas they were toying around with when they were trying to figure out the idea of democracy was exactly that, that nobody can nominate themselves. They have to be recruited. They have to be, people have to gather and say, we want this person. And then that person uh, may reluctantly accept, but they kind of have a civic obligation to accept. Um, I think that needs to be the law of the land. I really do. And I know some people might be, wow, Ron, that's that's pretty radical. That's a big shift. Yeah, look around you. You don't think we need one? And here's the second question. How could it possibly get any worse? Yeah. I mean, I mean it <laughs> could, but trying this out, trying this out, how could trying this out make it worse? I don't see how it could. Imagine the 2020 primary the Democratic 2020 primary, if the requirement was you had to be recruited. I mean, imagine who wouldn't have been <laughs> part of it. I mean, honestly, it probably would have been, it would have been Bernie Sanders. Um, it would have maybe been Marion Williamson, maybe Andrew Yang, uh, maybe Tulsi Gabbard. Those are, you know, the candidates that had a big kind of grassroots following that were all about their ideas that wanted to see them up there. That would have been it. I mean, I mean there was just... there was like an a, a pretty I would say it's probably pretty astroturfed movement to draft Biden in 2016. So I could have seen that kind of coming back too potentially. Maybe but, you know, it's, yeah. A but lot it of those been folks different. probably would have coalesced on one candidate. It wouldn't have been like this whole slap shot. Would have been 20. <laughs> right. I mean, it wouldn't have been. Yeah, it, it would have been a lot different, and it it, it would have been. I, I just think infinitely better. Like, like it yeah. would have just been like infinitely better where you would have had. And it's like, you can't nominate yourself for an award. You can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, you know, it could be like, you know, my last album was killer. I'm putting myself up for this Grammy. <laughs> you don't get to do that. You have to be nominated. It should be the same thing here. And it should be. And, and, and I got to say, I mean, I like Jesse Ventura. I'd be happy to vote for him. But even still, like, um, I'd like to say I'm like for the principle of it, regardless, because I remember in 08, um, there was a similar draft movement for Al Gore. And 
personally, I'm not really that big of an Al Gore fan. I wasn't then. I'm still not. And he wasn't my candidate of choice, you know, at any point um, in 08. But I still thought it was cool. Even back then, like I read their website and I just thought it was cool. I was like, okay, that, that's interesting. These people think that Al Gore is the person to meet the moment. I'm curious as to why they feel that way. I'm going to read about it. And I think it's cool that here's a guy that, you know, might not really want to get into the ring, but people are saying you're the person to meet the moment. That's intriguing to me. And I think that's how every candidate should get their shot. And and I know like some people say, well, if you do that, only celebrities are going to be in, in the, in the public spotlight. We're going to, you're going to have all these celebrities running for office. First of all, we already have that. Yeah. We already have that. Second of all, it won't be that way. What it will be is that politicians, instead of proving themselves to donors, which is what they do now, they'll have to prove themselves to people. Well, what I, what I would also point out, too, is, I mean, we already know, usually the folks that get the most politically involved are not, they don't, there's not as much intersection with the crowd that checks out for celebrities until the general election, you know, because those folks don't get involved in primary processes as much. So it's like, the folks who are going to start these draft movements are going to be politically interested. Uh, and then also let's change the media too. Right. Like, <laughs> so, well, yeah, well, that's the other thing you, you yeah. have to have a, you have to have a couple different things happen. Like you have to have, um, you would have to have some policy around money out of politics. Yeah. Because otherwise, you know, you would have, you know, like, like you said, these AstroTurf, like you would just have the wall street, you know, making these fake recruitment <laughs> campaign so so you know it, parties everywhere just right no <laughs> kidding with, with the Koch brothers pulling the strings with a smile on their face but so it's not like oh we just have to do this and that's all that needs to happen there needs to be other policy that falls into place with it but if you had money out of politics and you had like hey you got to recruit your freaking candidates they don't get to nominate themselves i think you would have a better bench really freaking quick yeah and I mean, the people that are concerned, what if the person says no? Uh, why not, if we're doing reforms like making drafting candidates mandatory, why not also in-state uh, ranked choice voting? You know? Yeah. Those, those things seem to really coincide with one another. You could draft your candidates in a ranked order, and then they would just get offered in the order. And if they refuse, it's the next one. It's, that would be a way better option than what we've got currently. Uh, but they, right now, you're incentivized to be a career politician, right? <laughs> well, they tell us that that's too complicated. That's what they tell us. They, they tell <laughs> sure. us that that's, just, that's just too complicated for us. Because you know, like when people go to a restaurant, they just they just they just look around, and if there's more than one thing they want on the menu or they're willing to eat, they just go, "I can't possibly <laughs> rank my decisions. I have to leave now. I have to go home." <laughs> that's how it works. It's true. I can't handle menus. You know, I just I don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Um, so. So let me let's bring it back then to currently what's going on. Um, have you had any interactions with Jesse himself? We've I, I can't tip my hand too much because I don't want to get anybody in trouble. Um, okay. But we've we've got our ways of getting in touch with the governor and, and folks will be folks will be learning information. Uh, we'll, we'll say that. And we've we've got a healthy amount of electors where our most important thing right now is getting them for Texas. Okay. Um, Cause the, the Texas deadline is coming up. So like in the next 24 to 48 hours, folks uh, check out the draft website. We've got a whole page on ballot access. There's instructions for how to be an elector for Texas. Um, yeah. So how does, how does a write-in work? Like, how does a write-in work? I mean, I know, like, you can just write somebody in, but as far as how that's going to be counted or where it's recognized, there's uh, a lot of red tape going on there that you guys have looked into. So what what's kind of, like, what's kind of the anatomy on how that works exactly? Yeah, so I, I got into this a little bit with Graham, but you, you would think that you would just write things in on your ballot and, okay, that vote would count, but... Yeah, and uh, there's only nine states in the country where write-ins are just permitted off the bat. And in fact, there's eight states that don't allow write-ins at all. You just, you don't get to democratically choose. We, we give you an option and you pick. Uh, <laughs> for the rest of the states, each state has its own process for uh, becoming an approved write-in candidate. 
And um, generally what that entails is getting a slate of folks to pledge to be electors uh, for that candidate, providing that they win the popular vote in that state. And it depends on the state in like in Ohio, we have one form that everyone is signing. Uh, and it's like an e-signature thing. In Texas, everyone has to do an individual form. In California, we're all going to have to go get our forms notarized. That's going to be fun. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's almost like they make this difficult on purpose. Yeah, you know, like they don't want <laughs> they don't want anything that threatens the two party duopoly. Yeah, they the one saving grace is that the deadlines are pretty far out. You can get like California's deadline is mid October. And the amount of signatures that you need compared to like independent ballot access is only equal to the number of electoral votes. So like for the whole state of Utah, we need six folks to be electors. <laughs> for Wyoming, I think it was three, but now I'm being told that they uh, are just permitting write-ins this year, which is exciting. They changed that in 2018. So did, does any state have like a more extensive signature threshold or is that pretty much the lay of the land everywhere? So the the highest number is California needs fifty five and Texas needs because 30. of the elect. Okay, so it's yeah. always it's always based on the electors, and that's everywhere. There's no state yep. that has some. Okay, yeah. Um, sometimes there's a filing fee. Um, if there is, we'll just pay for it and uh, fundraise for that later if we need to. You know, we we've hardly ever fundraised on purpose uh, because we wanted to show that like this is this is a popular movement based off of momentum. Uh, the governor's campaign didn't use a lot of money and we didn't want to take money underneath his name unless it was absolutely necessary. So like we, we took money to send an ad to him in his local paper, <laughs> which was honestly, that was a really effective way to get in touch with him uh, at, in the first place. We, we finally were able to flag him down uh, and get past like his publicist and anyone else that was being a barrier um, or just not able to completely relay information. And that seemed to have changed his tone a bit publicly. He also recently received this huge 12 pound stack of thousands of letters asking him to run <laughs> that was delivered straight to him. Um, and we got confirmation that that was given to him. Well, I think he kind of, you know, based on what I've heard him say publicly, it sounds like he, you know, holds the same principle that, you know, you and I have echoed during this show where, you know, I have heard him say, look, I'm not running, but if I am recruited for the job, I would not, I, I would do the job. And that's what we're doing. We're recruiting him. He's going to get his papers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so it's like, I, I don't, he hasn't you know, dodged a draft yet. So <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. we're holding it to him. <laughs> well, yeah. And I, and I think this should be, I mean, what's that cliche that they throw out? Like, 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 um, you know, what's it like heroes are recruited and they're reluctant. And do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I feel like I'm butchering a quote right now. And I, I don't know which quote I'm butchering, yeah. but I, I'm pretty much, I'm pretty sure I'm butchering a quote really like bad right one now. Messed up game of telephone. It's fine. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, but people get the idea, but it's like, yeah, yeah it's like, this is because everyone loves to say, well, he's not running. He's not running. He's not running. It's just like, yeah, but he also said, I wouldn't not do the job if the yeah. American people speak. And, and, and he also I think at one point he said he would write himself in. Yeah, he said that when he was on Primo Nutmeg. Um, his most recent comments when he talked about our movement, he said, I don't know what will come of this, but I guess we'll see what happens next. He also pointed out we were warning him to prepare to be ready. <laughs> did you? Yeah, we did. We did warn him. He, he got right. a bit of a heads up. <laughs> I mean, dude, this should be the way politics works. And again, there needs to be other policies surrounding it. Otherwise, Wall Street is just going to make all these fake things. But, you know, it should be a grassroots movement saying you're the person. And if the person says, I really don't want the job, they're all the more qualified because they said that. This should be the lay of the land for everything. It, it, there's one exception to it. Don't try to recruit me for anything. That's the only exception. Only exception. Not me, but anyone else in the world. Totally cool. I <laughs> yeah, not me, you guys. That's yeah, that's not me, you guys. <laughs> Don't recruit me. Don't recruit me. There's enough. There is enough footage of me on the internet saying I'm against. Uh, I'm against private property. Uh, quoting anarchists. I, I'd lose. I'd lose because all of that. All those clips would be. Um, 
would be heavily publicized because I, I'd be the one publicizing them. I'd be like, you can't <laughs> vote for this guy. This guy's nuts. Who tried to recruit him? <laughs> but but drafting other other people. <laughs> that's I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did this idea come about? I mean, I mean, you were one of the you were one of the are you one of the founders of this or, or one of um, the so I mean originally what happened was Jesse Ventura said he was considering running for the Green Party nomination in late April. And there mm -hmm. was a, an exploratory committee that was formed uh, to figure out the possibility of that. And then there was a draft pack form called We Want Jesse. And I had filled out a Google form to be a volunteer for that pack. And uh, they just kind of sat and spun their wheels in place. Uh, there's it's a rabbit hole of the amount of inaction and seeming either incompetence or sabotage that we dealt with from the leadership. And so a large portion of the volunteers decided that we should form a parallel organization and also try and draft Jesse so that we could uh, have a website, post ads, redesign the website because we didn't think the one that, there, that they had was very functional or appealing. Uh, there was a lot of different things in that regard. Someone was trying to slander us by saying it was just to open a store, but no one had ever talked. What kind about of fundraising. what kind of store? I just some so someone completely unaffiliated with any pack put up Ventura twenty twenty t shirts on Amazon. I don't know who the hell that was, but I'm assuming that is who set the precedent. But um, we never planned on opening a store. Uh, the person who filed the paperwork for the pack, whose name is on the FEC filings. She was she got like a free Shopify website. So that's the base that we use because I mean know, that's that's just really interesting that that's like the the route someone took. <laughs> like they're trying to open a store. Yeah. They're gonna open a store around an election that's gonna happen in a few months and just ride that store's <laughs> gravy train until November, and then they're all gonna retire because they'll all be millionaires. That's yeah, what's gonna, gonna happen. That's what they're trying to do selling merchandise for a guy who says he's not running and we're not going to campaign for him and try and draft him like that. No, that the intent was always to like set up the campaign to get him to run. So we, we broke off and we formed again, it was always a parallel organization. We had no intention to like sabotage them uh, or to work against them. It doesn't make sense that you would work against a pack working for the same candidate, but that was the story they spread for a bit, which was kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it's when you're trying to do something like this that's very nuanced, um, I feel like there's inevitably going to be a lot of growing pains. And, and you know, this is someone who's totally an outsider who doesn't have any yeah. inside information to give any input one way or another. But yeah, it's, it's not like, like we were bombarded with political consultants who gave us all the details we needed. It was like I'm a debate coach and, a, and like a like a, a random stand up comic in, in the Bay Area. Uh, and <laughs> Melissa, she, she's the CEO of a private company that like sells condoms to people online and men's health and wellness, you know, it's, Oh, so that's the store. So that's it, the store that you was, guys, that, you guys, why they, to, yeah, we were going to sell wanted, 2020 condom. That's what it was. <laughs> it was going to be a limited edition condom. Us. Jesse Ventura. <laughs> <laughs> oh Jesus. The body. No. Yeah, the, well, <laughs> That'd be a, it's like, name for a well, like, well, like wrestlers, they would always like stretch their shirts and stuff back <laughs> in the day. So it's like this is a condom, where it's like you just stretch it and stretch it, it doesn't break. Twenty twenty <laughs> condoms, and everyone's gonna be like, "Well, I gotta, I gotta use one of these puppies." <laughs> that would so, be amazing. All right, so it all was. It's, it's all, all right. been exposed. It's all been exposed. <laughs> Go home, folks. We figured it out. They they just wanted to sell condoms. But yeah, I, uh, I, would, I would say this was a pretty grassroots movement. You know, it was there's a lot of learning involved. There have been folks who've come and gone along the way because they've had to get back to their jobs. Sure. <laughs> so, you know, no, nobody's been paid for this. Mm -hmm. uh, we, well, we can, other than other yeah. than all the condom pre sales. Uh, other, other than the Ventura 2020 con, you know. Yeah, yeah, those <laughs> condom I mean, you guys are actually going to get Bezos to run for his money any day now with those <laughs> Yeah, keep your eyes peeled for when we go public. No. You guys have more condom pre-sales than Liz Warren has selfies. You guys are crushing it. And nobody knows. <laughs> but so, uh, well, what's a lot of us were former burners. Oh, I was just going to say, a lot of us were former yeah. burners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so, like, again, going big picture, 
when you see what goes on, and, and I've only had so many peeks under the hood into electoral politics. I've had more peeks under the hood than I've ever wanted to have in my lifetime. And it's, um, it has radicalized me, I guess you could say. <laughs> and um, when you see the way that world works, what it takes to be a professional staffer, and, and you see what those jobs really involve, you see that there's so many people, they don't see the difference between working for a Joe Biden versus working for a Bernie Sanders. To them, it's just a job that has a paycheck, yeah. and that's just what they do. This is not... This is not the type of industry. Well, first of all, the fact that it's an industry right away is a problem, but this is not the type of industry that will ever bring about any kind of systemic change. So we really have to rethink the way we go about electoral politics and, and just do a complete overhaul. And I think getting money out of politics, ranked choice voting, and I'm going a step further now and I'm saying you don't get to nominate yourself. You don't get to nominate yourself and then hire a staff out of a out of a stack of resumes and it's just about who's going to help you win the most. No, you have to get recruited. And that staff are going to be the people that are trying to recruit you and hopefully most of those people are going to be completely outside of that world and have no experience in it. Yeah. This is where I give a shout out to something like UBI for trying to make something like that possible, you know. If we have mm -hmm. sources of income that aren't tied to our employment, we're able to be more active about things that we care about. Well, and that's something else. A yeah. UBI, I mean, I, I'm I'm one of those people, I am for both a UBI and a federal jobs guarantee. I know a lot of people try to pit them against one another. And I, 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 I just, I'm for both. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's so misguided when you're for one and use that as a reason to be against the other or vice versa, it just doesn't make any sense because here's the thing with all of the nominal quadrillions that wall street is worth. And yes, I said quadrillions and that's real. That's, I don't even know how many zeros are in a quadrillion, but I know <laughs> it's a freaking lot. It's a freaking lot. Too many is right. And all of that can be traced back to the public's money. That's how Wall Street works. Giving everybody a real UBI is the equivalent. It'd be like if you and I were on a lovely California coastline, uh, anywhere in the state, you can pick the place, man. I'll meet you there. And we decided that we were going to take a speck of sand underneath our thumbnail. We were just going to scoop our thumbnail, get a little speck of sand under that thumbnail and take it away with us. Us taking that speck of sand is the equivalent of what it would be to give everybody a UBI. Uh, that that's that's so we can afford it is my point. We can afford it many times yeah. over. So <laughs> you should totally be for both. Now, UBI is another one of those things where you also need to have some other policy with it. You need to have rent control. You need to have all these other things so that it doesn't just turn into uh, you know, our dollar is just completely worthless because it's it's just like a bunch of hyperinflation because everybody knows that you're getting a set amount of money and there's no value exchange with it. So you need policies around it for the UBI to be effective. But that doesn't mean a U I mean, a UBI, like it, it would totally be a great thing if it's implemented the right way. Same with the federal jobs guarantee. Yeah, I mean, part of it too is just people, people conceptualize labor and money as being like all, always coupled, right? But sure. if, if you if you take that uh, a UBI would be able to give people some flexibility to do what they want, a jobs guarantee could try and connect people with work that they care about more than work that would, you know, pay them a bunch mm -hmm. in that way. So you, if you reframe those things, you know, maybe not everyone wants to be a trash man, but a lot there are people that don't want to have to go to work and think really hard. So it's not like there, <laughs> there's going to be a shortage of folks who want to do jobs like that that are important. Um, well, not, not just that, yeah. but I mean, you and look you at pay them accordingly, like garbage people deserve a lot with that, especially during COVID with all the crap they're handling, you know? <laughs> yeah, no kidding, man. And, and well, and it's one of those things, too. Like you look at, for instances, th there's all kinds of different ways on, on how a program could work. But you could totally have a feasible, for instance, where it's like take people like you and I who are, you know, in show business or whatever you want to call it. Um you know, say, you know, you're writing on a show and then your contract ends, the show gets canceled or whatever happens. And this happens to colleagues of mine every day, colleagues of yours every day. Um, maybe you don't have another contract for a while, but rents do. And, and you need, I mean, you can go yep. be like, oh, I'm going to go build solar panels until 
I get another yeah. gig or I'm going to go do like, like whatever this is with the federal jobs guarantee. You can just be like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm available for a little bit because I'm in between things and I want something to do. And well, here's something to do. I, I mean, there's just so many ways it could benefit our society. Uh, same as the UBI. That's why it'd be great to have a leader who is willing to try new ideas rather than someone who's ideologically inflexible, you know, now you're sounding radical. Yeah. And it's almost <laughs> oh, like no. it's almost like it's almost like if you got behind these types of people, more people would try to recruit their leaders instead of these horrific bought and sold politicians yeah. nominating themselves. I mean, Joe Biden has spent a political career. We can use him as an example. Joe Biden has spent a political career pleasing donors. I mean, you can find the footage of it. You can find footage of him. I, I, you know, however many years ago it was where he's like, I was ready to prostitute myself. His words, yeah, <laughs> his words. I am quoting him, his <laughs> words. I'm ready to prostitute myself for the big money. That's what he wanted. That's what he was all about. That's all it was all about to him. And he spent a career proving um, himself to those people, not proving himself to voters, not proving himself to the electorate, not proving himself to the working himself to the working class, proving himself to the donors. And now there is a chance where he might fail up all the way to presidency. Uh, Lauren Ashcraft pointed this out on the show when, when, when we were talking about it, she's like, it'll be such an amazing fail up story. If Biden yeah. somehow ends up being president, because first of all, he's not going to quote unquote win. I refuse to say Joe Biden wins because that would imply that this is actually an election. It's not. It's not Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. It is Donald Trump versus Donald Trump. And Joe Biden will be president if Donald Trump beats himself, which because yeah. of this pandemic, he might do that. Pre-pandemic, there was no chance at all. But now because of this pandemic, because it is such a topsy-turvy world, because it's so unprecedented, there is a chance that Donald Trump might beat himself. But that's the only way Biden's president, if Donald Trump beats himself so it will be the ultimate failing up story how can you look around at all this and not say we need radical systemic change to this gross system and one of the pieces of that puzzle is drafting our drafting our candidates yeah i mean compare compare a career politician who says he'd prostitute himself to uh jesse who literally wanted politicians to wear NASCAR suits with all their corporate donors on them and uh, decided not to run for a second term of governor because he was exhausted by all the media constantly dogging him. He wanted a private life for his kids while they were growing up, right? That's why he's always been so reluctant to get back into it. And like we said before, like that, that's kind of an admirable quality, someone who's not concerned about the vanity of the office, but just like would do the job if they got nominated or written in. I'll take it. Shit, <laughs> these other options are horrible. <laughs> Give me yeah, something. Yeah, no kidding. Howie Hawkins telling people in states that are dangerous to vote for Biden instead. That's what I heard recently. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm just like really grossed out by that. Are we really going to do the safe state strategy as a third party? Look at how well that worked in 04. That made the Green Party a footnote after 2000. That just sad, man. Well, and and... <laughs> And the thing is, and, and yeah, I mean, I, w I was very disappointed how he got the gig. And um, I kind of felt like this is a huge missed opportunity because you have this new generation of people that are looking for an electoral solution. And the Green Party had a moment to really have somebody in 2020 who's going to get to that 5% threshold and... I just don't see Howie Hawkins getting there. I, I don't see him getting close. And he might get less than Stein got. It doesn't look like he's on the ballot in as many states as she was. And it's like, I I don't really know what to say. We came at them with an option. Uh, the well, and, and the thing. The came at them with an option. Like, <laughs> see, I, I do think, I mean, I, you know, I was hoping it was either going to be Dario or Jesse. I mean, I, I think Jesse, Jesse Ventura would get to 5% on his own. He yeah. would get the 5% on his own. So he would get you that 5%. I think Dario, I, I think if everybody, if all the Green Party put all the resources behind a Dario Hunter and, you know, if he really, you know, mobilized, had, had a strong campaign, I think he could have gotten there. Uh, we'll never know. But I think Dario could have gotten there. Howie, I, I just don't, 
just as far as a candidate is concerned, I, I, I just don't see him getting there. Nowhere close. I, I mean, I, I just don't see it happening. It's the, and maybe I'm speaking for too many people, but at least in my mind. So after watching Bernie Sanders kind of just tuck his tail between his legs and give up, I was looking for someone with some energy if I was going to back someone for this election. Yeah. And, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. And I'm, and was, I'm not speaking for it. I'm speaking for myself. I'm yeah. speaking for myself <laughs> as a voter, as a citizen, as somebody who's just, you know, who wants to see uh, third and marginalized parties do well, who wants to see the duopoly break up, who wants to see all of that happen. Uh, that's what I'm talking as. And, and I'm just being like, this is just how I see it. Yeah. I mean, we've uh, we've been trying to broaden that conversation too. you know, uh, an overwhelming number of people have submitted forms to Unity 2020 asking them to draft Jesse, too, which I don't know how but what is what is with them. No, I'm, I'm not at all. What is Unity 2020? I don't know. So what have you heard about the Dark Horse duo idea? It was this this idea of drafting Andrew Yang and uh, I think it was it was Admiral McRaven. I'm hoping he's an admiral, and I didn't butcher butcher that. I'm not. I'm like, not. Fam I'm not familiar with this. Yeah, the, the I, idea I don't was, know. was drafting like a like a populist left and a populist right candidate. Okay. Uh, to to make a ticket that would unify the the like 50, 60 percent of, of folks that don't ascribe to the main parties, and they had had cold feet about outright endorsing Jesse. We'd been pressuring them for like a month. Their leadership, huh. and it, it's just like why? It's the Weinstein brothers are running it. So finally, they opened up their um, nominations process, and a bunch of people have started submitting Jesse as someone for them to talk about. And their their route to getting ballot access, I don't know what it is. So we're doing our own thing, but you know, we're trying to get as many groups on board as possible with the idea that Jesse plus someone would be a good idea. Jesse's been very flexible about VP picks whenever he's been asked. And and you're saying that the the pretty much overall deadline here is, is until mid October, like that's the deadline. It's so there's there's kind of rolling deadlines, right? So there's a couple this month. Texas and Ohio are the main okay. ones. Um, at the start of next month is Georgia and Massachusetts. Those are the next immediate ones, and then Utah. Um, but yeah, it just going along the line from there. And then there's a bunch due in mid October. And then there's a couple that's like right up on election day stuff can be submitted, but it's we're getting all of our eggs and or you know all of our all of our ducks in line early. Okay. Well, hey man, uh, that's a yeah, why not? Uh, <laughs> it's so, I mean, you need six people for a state. Why not give them the forms early? Like, <laughs> yeah, no kidding, man. <laughs> so, um, where can people go to learn more? So you should go to draftjesse.com. You can see on our website, there's a volunteer page. There's also a page detailing ballot access where you can learn more. Um, I've got a lot of questions recently about what it means to be an elector. So it's a, a really easy thing to understand. Like the, the electoral college isn't a physical place. It's a, uh, <laughs> that'd be a one. It's more, stretch. more just a horrible idea. Yeah, it's it's an more just a idea. really it's, bad idea. <laughs> but in every state, uh, the folks who are electors, which is what we're recruiting, they all, in a normal election, they all convene in the same place, usually like the state capitol, and then they cast their ballots in December after the election, once all the votes have been tallied. Um, we're assuming because of COVID that a lot of those would take place online, but uh, we've already told folks like the, the only instance where they would need to go cast a vote as an elector would be if Jesse won a state and if Jesse's winning states, we'll have the infrastructure to crowdfund to pay for their gas or their expenses. So I wouldn't be afraid about that. I would also expect a lot of elector voting to take place online. It's super simple. Uh, we'll walk you through it. Draftjesse.com and check out all the information there. So people can learn more at draft, draftjesse.com. Get your news on with Ron. Don't you want to know what's going on? We're getting our news on today. Get your news on with Ron. Don't you want to know what's going on? We're getting our news on today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can tweet me an article at Ron Placone. We'll go through it together and make